IPM for other Apple diseases. And as we started off a lot of the other ones, it's always best to remind everyone, including myself, that the best way to start with the disease management is to implement the best horticultural practices. And this will be really important when we talk about some of these other diseases. The high density apples are better for a color, yield per acre, and most importantly, your fungicide applications and drying time. Nearly every one of the fungi that we're going to talk about today cannot stand dry conditions. They need it for germination, they need it for infection. And as you can see in the picture below, you can imagine the drying potential for that tall spindle, um, fully dwarfing orchard is much better than the tall spindle semi dwarf. The more, better air circulation, the foliage is going to get drier. You're going to get better spray coverage, and then therefore better disease protection. The other thing to really pay attention to is the water management. Fungi love water, and even if there's a flooded ground, the trees will be more you know, uh, more heavily compromised, they'll be less vigorous, they'll be less healthy. So always make sure to pick the best sites, tile the orchards, and do a good job of drip um, irrigation management. Make sure that it's on when it needs to be on, and you don't get hard pans, because those also lead to problems with the disease as well. And in all cases, manage your weeds. It will help with the air circulation almost just as much as tree training, and sometimes the weeds can get higher than the trees and keeps your grass mowed and everything really well, and it gets all the junk and trash that you don't need in your orchard out, um, putting those disease-causing pathogens at incredible disadvantage. So, one of the other things we can do is use less sensitive cultivars, and I say that because for things like blat rot, shown over here on the right, we don't have a lot of resistance. It's a, it's a problem, but... Um, in many instances, there's not a lot of resistance breeding for black rot. Maybe in time, as it becomes a bigger issue in New York, maybe there might be some effort in breeding. But the problem is with breeding for rots is that rot fungi like sugar and water. And if you take away the sugar and water of the apple, it doesn't become very appetizing. It may make us less a sensitive um, apple to rots, but, uh, you know, you definitely want some sugar, water, and acid. And fungi do like those. So, um, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, there's not a lot of options for things like black rot, the bitter rot, the fly speck sooty blot, and my colleague of Ace has a really cool disease susceptibility of common apples, and you'll see that there's three things listed, and that's what's known. Cedar apple rust, powdery mildew, apple scab, and oh, four, and fire blight. But there's not a lot on the other information, and so you'll have to work a little bit with what is known anecdotally on these issues. And things that are very sugary, will rot very quickly, or things have a really thin epidermal covering, or often get fruit finish problems, will be the ones that will be the most heavily impacted by these particular issues. And let's talk about what those are in the coming slides. Oh, just some other examples of differences and different types of how all the varieties are, differ a lot and what they're resistant for. And you don't get something that's resistant to all of them, and people likely eat. So what else can you do? In order to put your best foot forward with all these rot spots, leaf um, foliar diseases, and other things that we'll end up seeing, it's really important to get the fruit drops out of there. Where these fungi like to live is like and survive over the winter is the same place as apple scab. They like to get in cracks, they like to get in old thinning mummies, they like to get in fruit drops, and they like to get in the leaves. And anything you can do to get rid of the leaf litter and dead plant material is going to help eliminate these. And they will also fruit just like apple scab and make spores in the spring. We just don't talk about them that often because they're not as important. Shown over on the right is a nice picture from an orchard in Brazil where they have a sanitation machine that has these huge paddles that sweeps everything into the front row and then they come by and chop it up. And if you had something like that, you could also um, then come through with a um, raking everything yourselves into the row middles, scalping that sod that's right there, or putting on urea or dolomitic lime. As shown here, uh, well, you wouldn't want to play, put your real light, you put it on the ground. But um, it is also possible to put it on the tree. One of the other things that we often do is that delayed dormant copper application. And I've mentioned it for fire blight, I mentioned it for apple scab. But the bottom line is, is it's going to hurt all these fungi. They're all, with the exception of fire blight, which is a bacterium, all the fungi are pretty much in the same class and type of fungi. And they all like a lot of the same things. Yes, they're different. But in many instances, they're all using the same strategies to cause problems in your orchard, mainly because your orchard is an apple. So they're all going at it from the same sort of um, plan of attack, if you will. And if you implement a lot of these general management practices, you can do a lot before you even get to the point where 
summer foliage, uh, foliar diseases end up showing up. And these might include things like glomerella leaf spot right down here from North Carolina or Marcinina leaf blight, which um, we do have in New York, but the picture I'm showing is from China. And the level of defoliation can be quite um, intense. You can see in this particular orchard here, lots of yellow, yellow, yellow. And anywhere you see that yellow and speckliness or ratty looking um, shoots, that's all complete defoliation. And you don't want all that defoliation around the time your fruit are developing and may want to put on, I mean, it might be great for color, but the fruit development will be quite awful. And you might think, wow, I can get excellent cover when my trees default, uh, color when my trees defoliated. But that's not the kind of color you want because the fruit just aren't going to be very good and they're not going to size right and you won't get a lot of good return um, buds in the previous years. So how do you beat these things? Typically what you do is you can also manage them with your apple scab um, programs. And as I mentioned before, a lot of these things all follow the same pattern of attack. Let's wait out the winter on junk in the orchard and let's make some ascospores in the spring with a with a bigger focus of some of these others right around bloom to petal fall. That sort of 10 to 15 millimeter timing can become pretty important for a lot of these. And how we've been able to manage them in the four previously is relying on the single site fungicides. They become bigger problems in organic operations where you don't have these really, really highly effective um, fungicides that target genes inside fungi. And those are so effective that they clean up a lot of these things. And since we've gotten a lot of resistance to these in apple scab, we've kind of abandoned them and used more heavily on the protectants. They're just not as effective and you might see them creeping through unless you put a lot of sulfur in your organic operations out there or a lot of uh, very similar captan and mancozeb in the others. And they may not get them all. It's just some, um, something to be mindful for. What really gets them are these single site fungicides. Uh, now we got frog eye leaf spot onto the equation. In many instances, the pathogen loves to hang out in thinning mummies. So if you have a variety with a lot of uh, thinning mummies, this is the one that you might end up seeing causing this type of problem. And it's caused by the black rot and white rot fungi. So not only can they do leaf blights, they can also do fruit rots as well. And the best way to get them are those single site fungicides. The QOIs, the SDHIs, and the DMI fungicides really provide a high level of control. And in these, they haven't been exposed for very long. And so the, the likelihood of resistance development is much lower than in other systems. And then with a combination of good sanitation, the summer cover applications and picking the right cultivar, try to avoid some that make a lot of thinning mummies if you can, then you won't have a, as big of a struggle managing these types of things. So those are sort of the foliar ones. What about the fruit ones? And I mentioned before this black rot is also causing the same thing as the frog eye leaf spot for the most part. And these summer fruit diseases will include uh, fly speck sooty blotch right down here, which doesn't actually harm the fruit, but it gets on the surface and will get your fruit rejected um, during the marketing process. A bitter rot, I'll show on the next slide. And then we have the black and white rot, which can look very similar. This one's black rot. If you were to touch it, it's kind of smooth, hard, gives you a feeling like a well-polished peanut. If it was the white rot one, it'd be very soft and necrotic and your finger would go right into the hole when trying to touch it or into through the epidermis when trying to touch it. Where these happen is the infections I mentioned earlier happen around from bloom to early fruit development. This is the critical period for really managing these. They can also come back later if you have a lot of pre-harvest rains. If get rainfall gets really heavy in the fall, right before you're about ready to pick them and put them in the storage, or you end up getting um, mature fruit out there and some bird decides it wants to come by and poke a hole in your fruit. I often see wounds with um, these various fungi just all around it. Also, even a slight herbicide mist droplet can hit an epidermis of a fruit, something such as a burn down material, and it will create just the right, perfect environment for some of these fungi that just want sugar and water to get inside the, um, the peel of the apple and rot everything out. And where they become a big problem is in post-harvest and storage, and they can lead to pack out rejections. Um, they can also lead to problems where those people buying or receiving the apples can't recognize the problems themselves, and blame other more exotic and invasive problems on the fruit rots that they're seeing, which um, can be very frustrating uh, should those problems not really occur in New York. Where do they show up the worst? As we're getting warmer and warmer, wet, warm springs and wet, warm falls, we might see them. And typically they're a bigger problem in warmer sandy areas like Hudson Valley or Long Island. And then again, they will become a 
bigger problem in organic operations in those areas. If you have to rely heavily on multi-site protectant fungicides because of resistance concerns, you might see one more of these. This particular bitter rot that I'm showing here is one of those ones that has been hit with a bit of herbicide. You can see how bleached white that lesion is. And um, we had this because there was a lot of herbicide damage in that orchard there. And every fruit that was near the ground, and this one's near the ground, um, had was just covered in these. And then sometimes they just had white spots with no bitter rot. Other times it can just be a highly susceptible cultivar, such as this one, and the whole thing will look unreal. But it actually is also just a bitter rot. So how to beat them? Um, really focus on those petal fall fungicides. And this is the time where the single site fungicides will be important. It's not a bad time to step away from captan because in that 10 to 15 millimeter um, time period, you're gonna have a lot of things in the tank. You're gonna be thinning, you're gonna be doing insects, you're gonna be doing foliar nutrients. And you know, captan can get just a little bit of any of the oily formulations of anything in that tank can bring captan in and probably cause more trouble than the um, summer fruit rot diseases. So be careful of that. It's a good time to get those single sites in. Um, once you've done this and you've really got that good petal fall and first cover, then, you know, if it's not raining a lot, you can extend those intervals, 14, 21 days. If it's super dry, maybe even longer. But then finally, when you come back to the, your last application before harvest, select one of those single site fungicides with a zero day PHI. And then you can apply that on. And then once the team can go in, usually four hours later, um, you can pick that stuff up, put it in, get that thing packed away, and so it goes into storage with a nice light coat of protection. And with these, uh, the best materials, as I mentioned before, the single site fungicides will include the SDHIs are decently effective. The DMIs and the QOIs are also particularly effective, and there's not a lot of resistance to these. If you don't want to use a model and you just want to think about it, you might look about 10 to 14 days out and ask yourself, have I had more than a half one and a half inches to two inches of rain. And, you know, if it's been more than five days or a week and you've had that, probably time to put another cover on just to keep these things at bay. And then your cover interval can be 10, 21 days approaching harvest. And then you usually end up with that last little low PHI single site fungicide before harvest to send all your apples off into storage as, as best protected and as free of disease as you possibly can. Now, interestingly, we do have one model for these, and it's a Flyspec Sooty Blotch forecasting model out of NUA. You can find it at that address. And what that really does, it has two um, sort of two features. You put in your petal fall date, and you put in your most recent application. Now, for the first time you use it, it will just really predict the onset of the epidemic, which is about, it's looking at weather about 10 days after petal fall. So you might think of the apple scabbling is starting at uh, green tip. This one starts looking around 10 days after petal fall. But you can put in your, your petal fall um, date right there. And it's the petal fall date for Macintosh. But, you know, to be perfectly honest, I would just pick the earliest cultivar at your um, at your location. And then once you have does that, it will predict a risk level. And in this case, it's showing a rather extreme risk because it has not taken into account my most recent fungicide. You'll always want to put that in any time you run this model. And what it really does is it just sort of helps you with determine the timing of applications. What it's going to do is it's going to look at, okay, well, how much rain has passed? 1.63 inches, but is there any more coming? Is it dry? When was the last application? 14 days. You know, things are in that yellow look that you can kind of see at the bottom of the slide, making you um, a little bit concerned that it might be time for a material. So that's sort of what it does. We've got some new leaf wetness algorithms that really help track all the leaf wetness. And, you know, um, you can um, use the sensor on your site, or you could do one from a nearby site that sort of has sort of the satellite-based leaf wetness. Some things to think about. Um, it's really just going to pick, like all the models, it's just telling you what conditions are favorable. And, you know, not every infection is going to happen. You, you probably can safely go without these every, more than 10 days, unless it's one of these periods where it just won't stop raining. And, you know, always use common sense with any model. You are always smarter than the machine. Um, you can consider other factors that aren't immediately inputted on this web page, if you will. And um, it's always better for resistance-wise to just end up making that fungicide application prior to an infection. If you spray afterwards, you're just sort of pushing things towards uh, fungicide resistance. So with that, let's wrap up this um, section.